I want to continue talking this week about uh, calling and being called by God. And last week I talked a bit about Abraham from, well, at that point his name was Abram at, uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And this week I want to start again with Abram as well in thinking about, well, more than what we had then. You see, Abram, when I was talking about him, I said, you know, it's, it's, it's not really clear in the Bible how often he heard God's voice, how often he connected with God in that way. Um, we're going to get to one in chapter 15 here, verse 1 in a second, but that's three chapters on, you know, and, and there are different times, sure, we, we maybe in prayer, maybe talking to other people, we, we can hear God talking to us, but we have more than he had. We have this. We have Bibles. And so I want to talk this morning about hearing God's call by his word, the Bible, and a little more than that, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. But he didn't have this written record that we know of anyways that, that he could refer to um, to go and say, well, what did God say? And, but we have that. And it's such a vital resource for us in our lives. Let's look at that verse, Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. I pulled on this verse for a couple reasons. Uh, firstly, because this is the first time we see this in the Bible. The word of the Lord came to. But that continues on over and over and over again in the Bible after this. For different people, the word of the Lord came to David. The word of the Lord came to Jehu. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to all these different people, and it became that phrase, and we will see that carried into the New Testament in a couple of minutes. The second reason was, like I said, he didn't have this. When the word of the Lord came to, right, it wasn't some Bible floating through the air. <laughs> it, it's, it's more than just words. Considering one of the prophets, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 verse 4, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, I don't know if you've got your electronic Bible. I was just checking in mine to make sure. I know in my printed Bible as well. We have things that were uh, added on to help us in reading the Bible. So when it was first written, all of these different things, they didn't have these chapters and verses. Those were, were things were added later on to help us find them and help us reference them. You know, it's like you're trying to drive to somebody's house, and if you don't have an address, it's a little bit harder, isn't it? <laughs> And so, in trying to help each other in finding things in God's Word, the Bible, they added chapters and verses so that we had addresses for them. And we can go, okay, you know, uh, most of you have probably heard of John 3.16, either some guy holding up a placard at a football game, or some means by which that address has gotten logged into your brain. And many people who have walk the Christian experience out for any length of time, even have that memorized. They know not just the address, they know what's at the address. And that's helpful for us as we want to hear God's voice and understand His word to us. What is He saying? How, what is He calling us to? And this call that happens, right, in here it says the call of Jeremiah as a heading for this section in the Bible. So they don't just, they didn't just put in chapters and verses, they put in headings so that we could get a sense of, well, what's this thing coming up? And in both my electronic version and my printed version, it says the call of Jeremiah. There's this calling coming upon his life. And, and the Word of God calls to us in our lives. Now onto that New Testament reference in 
the so the Old Testament is the Bible that the Hebrew people had. Bible. Bible is a word that just means a collection. It, you know, anyone know the French word for library? Bibliothèque, right. Well, the roots of that are where we get Bible from. It's a collection of books. And, and so the Old Testament is a collection of books that were a part of the, the Hebrew legacy and journey with God. And the New Testament is the journey and legacy of the people that, that uh, heard Jesus speak and then followed after him, the Christians. And here we have in John chapter 1, one of, whoops, one of Jesus' uh, close disciples and followers. In fact, at one point it talks about John laying his head on Jesus' bosom. They just like, he was leaning up against Jesus, you know. It's like they were that close kind of friends. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John carries this forward. He carries it into uh, our New Testament experience, this experience with Jesus saying, that word that came to people wasn't just a voice, wasn't just words, but it was a person. It was living. He was alive, this person that came to him. This word isn't just some angel or demigod, which some speculated about, right? Because God couldn't, sort of inheriting some of the Greek philosophies that God couldn't possibly become material because material things were lesser things. Well, no, Jesus is God. And Jesus isn't just some kind of concept or philosophy or theory. Jesus is a person. The Word is a person, and that's what John is getting right at right at the beginning. And if you read that, he sort of reflects, sort of his, his account of Jesus' life refers back to the beginning of creation, because he goes on to talk about that, and we'll reference that a little bit as well. And that's where we get to Hebrews 11, verse 3. I know I'm taking a bit of a journey along through the Word, but I'm trying to help us to, to really grab onto this concept that, that when the word comes to us, it's not just a thought. That was what some of the, the Greeks and, and early philosophers tried to do with, with the Christian concept was that the logos or word in Greek could also be translated wisdom or thought or word. And so it's not just philosophical, it's not ethereal, it's not, it's not not a person. Jesus is a person. And in Hebrew, the letter to the Hebrews here, from the New Testament Christian perspective, writing to people who have that Jewish background, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And that's, right, even a struggle in science. They, they have this problem. They, they, you know, they agree that the universe is here. <laughs> um, they're not um, of some veins that think everything is just some kind of illusion. This is real. It's real matter. It really exists. But how did it get here? And that's the problem. How did it arrive? And if you work backwards, eventually you get to a problem point where what exists seemingly didn't exist at some point. And so whether you believe in God and whether you follow uh, the faith that we're talking about here in Jesus or whether you just believe completely in a materialistic, scientific kind of world, you have to have some level of faith. By faith, we believe. At some point, some people, by faith, you believe that, you know, matter has just always existed, which, again, working back through physics and uh, astronomy, you know, like, they can't, they get to this point where it's like, okay, we got a problem. Or you can believe that someone did exist, 
the Word of God. And by that Word, everything was created. And if you continue reading in John's Gospel, chapter 1, you'll see that he talks about that, that the Word created everything. It's, it's something that, that the Word of God is calling, is speaking, right? The, the account in Genesis chapter 1 is God spoke and things became. For God, he doesn't separate his thoughts, his words, his actions like we do. We have some problems aligning those things up sometimes. Yeah, I don't know if you ever had your parent tell you, don't do what I do, do what I tell you. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Hypocritical parent, right? Like... But we, we are all hypocrites, okay? I'm part of the club. I'm not trying to get down on anybody. We all have not lined up what we believe with what we live in our lives. But that doesn't dissuade us from saying this is what the way we should live. This is the things we should work on. This is the way we should grow. And that's the Word of God to us as well. When the Word comes to us, it's often with an intention to change. God doesn't speak to us just to keep us the way we are. Otherwise, we'd be perfect and he'd have nothing to say to change us. God speaks to us because he wants us to change. When Jesus was alive and walking, right? Here he is, the word of God walking on the earth. He had this encounter. And it's in the different gospels. It talks about Satan coming to tempt Jesus. And in Matthew's account, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it goes, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Because Jesus had just fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. Yeah, as any of us would be. Here's proof. Jesus was physical and real. He got hungry. And he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus even refers to the written word as being vital to our lives and how we live our lives and hearing what God is speaking. But he doesn't just relate it to rules on a page or concepts for us to consider. Or He says, you know, this is life. You know, you take the most essential form of food, bread, and he says, that's not as important as the Word of God for us. That's not as important as every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is, is referring for his own human existence. So here's a perfect human being walking on the planet, and even he says, look, we need the Word in our lives. So, I would assume most people here and online have had breakfast. Most people, probably. Not everybody, necessarily. I would assume, probably, you have lunch plans. And even if you don't have a lunch plan, you have a lunch urge. <laughs> right? It used to be, you know, you could know when we were hitting noon because all these stomachs would start to growl, right? Everyone's just got this urge to feed. We need to nourish this body. But we aren't just a body. We have a spiritual existence. And we need to feed that existence as well. And that's what Jesus is saying. Life, right? This, ascent, this, this essence and essential to life, food that our body needs to keep functioning, well, we have a spiritual life that requires spiritual food as well. In fact, one Old Testament prophet had a, a visionary encounter with God and, and there was this scroll that he had to eat. <laughs> we have to engage with that. See, the Apostle Paul wrote to his spiritual son 
Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God. This is what Jacqueline referenced a little bit in her uh, message. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All Scripture. Now, when Paul's writing this, all he has is basically this Old Testament. That's, that's what Paul's dealing with. But even the apostles, the New Testament writers, as, as they were moving on in their, in their engagement with the church on behalf of God, that Jesus had left them to lead, that they were starting to realize that some of what they were writing had this breath of God coming through it. And the early church even started re- doing that because Peter writes about how certain churches had started collecting Paul's writings and realizing this, this was vital for church life. And so the church has kept that over the centuries. And it helps us to recognize some of what maybe the, they missed in the Old Testament of what God was saying. It's not always so, so clear to us, the voice of God. But those things are there to help us. Now, he gives us some different reasons why we need to be listening to God speak and listening to this word. Teaching. Instruction. Helping us learn and know what is right. How to think right. We have so many, the information overload that people go through nowadays with blogs and vlogs and newspapers and, you know, social media. It's just crazy. We've seen the example of this in the whole response to the pandemic because now you've got one problem with 20 million answers because everybody's got a solution. And if you don't like the solution of one person, you can go listen to the solution of another person. And now it starts to become, you know, what's fake news? Well, what's fake science? What's fake medicine? What's fake? We're, we're struggling to find our way, but people are, are just grabbing everything that makes them feel good. So, you know, well, it's okay to wear masks, then it's not okay to wear masks. And then it's okay and it's needed and well we have to try and sift that out but part of the the help we have if we're following God and listening for his voice and wanting to hear that calling is he's given us this now it doesn't talk about COVID-19 in here (laughs) but the Bible does have some things to say about hygiene the Bible does have things to say about eating properly and looking after your health. Right? There's, there's things in there that are valuable for us to recognize and not just sort of, okay, sarah, sarah. Next, we have reproof or rebuke or a, a strong disapproval of what you're doing. <laughs> So sometimes we would like to tear certain pages out of here because I don't like what it says. What do you mean I should not be angry and sin? Now it doesn't say don't be, just not be angry. The Bible says don't be angry and sin. Even God gets angry, so that can't be wrong. There is righteous anger. There's right, there are things that go on that it's right to be angry over. Abuse, it's okay to feel angry about that. But we can cross over into condemnation, cross over into judgmentalism, cross over into sinful ways of addressing that anger or expressing that anger. And the Bible helps correct that, rebuke that in our lives. So we read Jesus say, you know, bless, don't curse. We, we read those things and it's like, oh, man, i got to deal with that. You know, if you go to the Old Testament, in, into the Ten Commandments, which we don't try and walk after in a legalistic kind of way, but those commandments reflect God's nature and character. And so when it says, don't covet what your neighbor has, and how much of that goes on, oh, 
So-and-so just got that new 80-inch curved TV. Man, 4K, it's so real. And what's creeping into our hearts? What are, we, what are we allowing in? And so we can get reproof. We can get rebuked. We can go, no, nah, wait a minute. And God's calling to us to live differently, right? Because this is all for righteousness. The in righteousness part at the end isn't just for the training, which we'll get to in a second. It's for all of these things. Next, for correction. Now, I don't know if you have read this passage before, but I've struggled with it before. Well, what's the difference between reproof and correction? And so I did some digging to make sure I understood it. And the word means not correction as in correction from wrong things, like reproof is. Correction as in renovating things to be what they were supposed to be. Correcting as in the right kind of thing. It's an improvement. It's a restoration of things. So you find something that's, like my wife and I found with our tent trailer, some flooring that was rotting. <laughs> it needed correction. We had to cut it out and put in a good flooring. That's, that's the correction it's talking about. There are areas of our lives that are weak and rotten and, and, and need some you know, spiritual surgery to correct that. Let's, let's just remove that out of there. It's going to cause you trouble. And then training, of course, which is like a discipleship or an apprenticeship. It's, it's like Paul said, you know, watch people strong in faith and maturity and do what they do. Learn from them. Paul himself says, you know, as, follow me as I follow Christ. He recognized he wasn't perfect. But to the degree that he followed Christ, he wanted others to follow him. And I guess that brings another kind of reflective, thoughtful moment for us all in that, you know, that, that parenting, don't do what I do, do what I say kind of thing, <laughs> where we all have to reflect on, am I living what I want others to live? Do I want this youngster to be like me in this? And maybe I need to change because it's not righteous. It's not the righteousness of God. So this word comes, and earlier in, in we read Hebrews 11, Hebrews chapter 4, and many of you probably know this verse, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. It's not just dead words on a page. Sharper than a two-edged sword. I don't know if you've ever been cut by the word, but it's sharper than a paper cut <laughs> because it pierces and divides our souls and our spirits of joints and marrow and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. James writes, it's like a mirror. You know, we, we look in it and we see ourselves for the way we really are and it separates those things out so that we can deal with them. So, are you listening? Are you hearing God call? Are you hearing the word of God today? Because this is what happened with Jesus when he was walking around. Matthew 9, 9. Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose up and followed him. And the word of God is calling to us all. Will we follow Jesus? Will we follow him? He's calling from his word and he's calling by the spirit of God today, I believe. He's calling out to all of us to follow him. To make that choice. It's a decision we get to make. God gives us free will because he loves us enough to allow us to freely love him. Not out of duty or resignation, but out of love, out of adoration. That's, that's why we call this worship. So this morning, 
some takeaways. Have you heard the call of God in the Bible? God speaks through prayer and people speaking for him. Uh, I trust I'm speaking for him well today. But when did you last read your Bible? Jesus said, this is your daily bread. There's even a devotional out there called Daily Bread. Right? This is, this is what we live on. Are you emaciated spiritually? Or are you healthy? Some of us, maybe, we've read and ate too much and not exercised it enough. That's maybe a different story, <laughs> different time. Have you responded with your, what, to what you heard? When the Word of God comes to us, we have to acknowledge and act. When, when God speaks to us, we have to acknowledge Him and act upon what He's telling us. Otherwise, like I said, you're not exercising, you're just, it's just there. And it, if you do acknowledge it and partake of it, but don't act on it, we get to be flabby Christians in our spiritual life. Hear Jesus calling you to follow him. Decide today. Decide every day. You know, some mornings you get up, I'm like, oh. Jesus is like, follow me. Come on, get out of bed. Let's go. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of person in your life. Maybe you're not a morning person. <laughs> Jesus is always a morning person. Right? It even says in his, in his physical existence, Jesus would, Jesus would often get up early and go out to pray. <laughs> and then his disciples would finally wake up and go, where'd Jesus go? Well, let's... let's Rise up and listen and follow him. Read the first chapter of the gospel according to John this week. That's my challenge for you. Just, just to read that one chapter. If you're new to the Bible, um, there's great resources on the internet, Bible Gateway. Um, there's free apps for your smartphone, like Uversion. And uh, there is still the old-fashioned printed thing. And if you're not sure where that is, there's a table of contents in the front of all these. And you can find the page. Or you could find a Christian who's a little more mature and ask them to do it with you, which would be awesome. Let's just pray for a moment as we wrap this up. And uh, let's decide to follow Jesus today. Lord, I thank you that you're calling to us this morning. I thank you that, that you speak and that your voice can be heard. Lord, you don't just speak in, Bible, in the words on the Bible, Lord, on the pages. Lord, you speak through one another. And Lord, I just pray this morning I've spoke well for you. And God, that people would respond to you. Your word calling out to us to follow you. That call goes out all the time. The question is, will we respond? I pray we do in Jesus' name. Amen.